Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. The fourth grade students worked diligently on their composition titled If I Were a Wizard. Bertha Miller watched with affection as the children poured their fantasies onto paper. She anticipated the surprises and discoveries awaiting her in the evening when she would evaluate the children's creativity. But the young teacher's minor mood was abruptly interrupted by the squeak of the door, blown open by a gust of wind. Bertha grimaced, remembering that she had long wanted to ask the school's workshop manager to fix the door. However, beyond intentions, no action had been taken, and the unpleasant sounds continued to bother not only her but also the children. Now they, too, were distracted from their notebooks, and laughter echoed through the classroom. Guys, it's the invisible hat-wearing wizard who's come to visit us. Velma Taylor, the main activist in the class, put forth her version. Yeah, he deliberately came to see what we're writing about. Brock Lewis didn't stay out of the general discussion and stated quite seriously. Wizards couldn't care less about what we write. Velma, he'll be in a fix if he reads your composition. You've got two mistakes in every word. Velma Taylor was offended and threw a paper snowball at Brock Lewis. Bertha Miller realized it was time to cool down her students. She sternly reprimanded the activists. Velma Taylor and Brock Lewis, you will go to the corridor now to sort out your differences, and for the compositions, you'll receive a failing grade. Brock immediately oriented himself. Bertha Miller, it was Velma Taylor who started it first. She always tries to stand out. Like she's the smartest among us. Laughter swept through the class, and the teacher, with a pleading tone, said. Guys, don't get distracted. You'll have time to discuss everything later. Finish your compositions and submit them, there's very little time left until the bell. The door squeaked again, and Bertha Miller decisively headed for it to close it more tightly. But before she could execute her plan, the school's deputy director burst into the classroom. As expected, the children greeted the authority with a unified rise. Mrs. Anderson kindly said. Sit down, kids. And you, Bertha Miller, please come with me to the principal's office. This was said in an authoritative tone that shocked the young teacher. She tried to object. Mrs. Anderson, could I come after the lesson? I can't leave the class, it's against the rules. The deputy director responded with evident disdain. Rules don't seem to apply to you, Bertha Miller. Bertha noticed how her students perked up their ears and gave a meaningful look to the deputy director. All right, Mrs. Anderson, I'm coming. Kids, finish your composition and I'll be back soon. Velma Taylor, you'll be in charge. A dissatisfied whisper flew through the class. Velma Taylor again. Bertha Miller wanted to say something else, but the deputy director gave her another disapproving look and firmly said. Bertha Miller. She had to comply and follow the superior. Why the urgency? Couldn't this wait until break? Without turning around, the deputy director said. You'll address your complaints to Mrs. Clark. She asked for your presence. And though I have an idea, the reason is well known to you. Let's not speculate. Mrs. Clark will explain everything to you. It felt like she was being escorted. Strong agitation prevented her from focusing, and just before entering the principal's office, the young woman trembled. It seemed the deputy director was relishing the effect she'd created. She eyed the young woman from head to toe with an unfriendly look and only then said with the same disdainful expression. That's how it always goes, first, making mistakes, then trembling with fear. Darling, suddenly, the deputy director slapped Bertha on the shoulder in a friendly manner, you should think first. That's what the head is for, but apparently, you're using a different part of your body for thinking. Bertha wanted to express outrage about the insinuation, but her strength failed her. On wobbly legs, she entered Mrs. Clark's office. The headmistress had an iron character, and everyone in the school was openly afraid of her. As soon as Bertha Miller crossed the threshold of her office, Mrs. Clark assumed the pose of a cobra ready to strike. Even her small head with neatly combed hair and a tidy bun at the nape stretched forward. 
So, Bertha Miller, what do you have to say? The teacher took two steps forward and froze under the hypnotic gaze of the principal. Almost inaudibly, she said. Hello, Mrs. Clark. The deputy director said you wanted to see me. The headmistress rose from her throne-like chair. Wanted to? No, seeing you is not a pleasure but rather a necessary duty. Tell me, Bertha Miller, how did you come to this? The young woman was starting to regain some composure. Come to what? The headmistress said sarcastically. Don't pretend to be an innocent lamb. You know perfectly well what I'm talking about. Feel free to let me know if there's anything else I can assist you with. Mrs. Clark gathered her courage, signaling the start of an intense attack on her adversary. Though Berta had heard about this particular trait of the principal's dialogue many times, this was her first encounter with it. Senior colleagues advised maintaining silence in these moments, as any careless word or even an inadvertent gesture would further agitate Mrs. Belskaya. The only thing the trapped teacher dared to do was not to lower her gaze. She looked at Mrs. Belskaya, who continued her accusatory speech. Bertha Miller, how could you stoop to such a level? You were recommended to us as a qualified professional with high moral standards, and yet you started a relationship with your student's father. Don't you understand that this is unacceptable? The emotional speech demanded a break, and Mrs. Clark paused. Seizing the moment, Berta firmly stated, that's not true. Do you actually believe in rumors? Mrs. Belskaya had already caught her breath and lunged at her subordinate, abruptly becoming familiar, you don't give me advice. Right now, I'm just warning, but don't think this is the final warning. Another signal like this, and you'll be expelled from my school like a cork. I'll give you such a recommendation that not even a specialized boarding school will accept you, understood? Yes, Mrs. Clark. I understand. Then go. And every day before classes, you'll provide me with a detailed plan. Not just a piece of paper with notes, but a minute-by-minute -minute schedule. I need to be aware of everything happening in my school. Okay, Mrs. Clark. And she walked toward the massive doors. But the principal detained her with a shout, Don't rush, Bertha Miller. I haven't released you yet. The principal settled back into her majestic chair and spoke more amiably. Of course, I'm not against creative solutions, but a modern teacher must inspire children to create. The educational process in our school should be based on this main principle. Therefore, I don't see any rationale in an essay topic like what I would do if I were a wizard. It's just a cheap trick to win students' sympathy, nothing more. All right, Mrs. Clark. From now on, I'll choose different topics for creative assignments. Bertha Miller rushed out of the office and leaned against the cold wall. Not only her face, but her whole body was burning, and her heart was beating fast. Her thoughts became tangled, and the young woman feverishly wondered what this summons meant and what would happen next. With great difficulty, she gathered her thoughts and returned to the classroom, where a deathly silence prevailed. She was met by thirty pairs of children's eyes filled with anticipation. The young woman realized that the kids were worried about her. She smiled. Well done, everyone. I hope you all managed the assignment? Velma Taylor enthusiastically added, Bertha Miller, I've already collected the notebooks. The teacher thanked the active student. Just then, the bell rang, and the children left the class in a noisy group. For Bertha Miller, this was the last lesson, and she hurried to the teacher's room, where she again encountered the ubiquitous deputy director. Mrs. Anderson was burning with curiosity. She blocked the passage with her powerful figure and inquiringly asked. Bertha, did you get a hard time? Such a sudden change in the mood of the deputy director didn't surprise Bertha. There were jokes about the deputy director's persistence. People in the staff avoided any contact with this lady. Bertha Miller also decided to quickly disengage. She forced a smile. Don't worry about me, Mrs. Anderson. The young woman's voice sounded confident, surprising her opponent. But while the deputy director was searching for appropriate words, Bertha Miller left the teacher's room. In her mind, she thought, she must be such a snoop. She reported on me herself, and now she's pretending it's not her fault. 
This mental message was directed at Mrs. Anderson, who had witnessed several meetings between the young teacher and Gloria Simmons' father. Although these meetings were purely professional, as Bertha now understood, the deputy director saw something else in them. Bertha Miller was 100% sure that it was Mrs. Anderson who reported her to Mrs. Clark. In her soul, a wave of protest rose hotly, but the voice of reason advised, calm down, Bertha. Knowing that Belskaya keeps her promises, you worked so hard to get into this school, and if they kick you out of here. Bertha didn't want to develop this thought further and hurried to the daycare to pick up her son early. Seeing his mom, Vernon started hopping on one leg out of joy. Mom, today we watched a movie about different birds. I like the stork the most because it can stand on one leg for a long time. The daycare teacher gently said. Vernon, you're not a stork, you're a human, and your experiments might end sadly. To Bertha Miller, the daycare teacher said. I don't know what to do with them. They're like little monkeys. As soon as they see something interesting, they start imitating. Bertha Miller helped her son fix the zipper on his jacket. She shared her opinion on the matter with the daycare teacher. All kids try on the roles of animals or birds. And that's normal. Today, I suggested to my fourth graders to become wizards for a while. Beside the noise, Vernon exclaimed. Wow, mom, I want to be a wizard too. The daycare teacher and the boy's mom exchanged glances, and the teacher asked. And what would you do if you became a wizard? Vernon wrapped his arms around his mother's neck and said seriously. I would make sure kids don't cry and my mom too. This confession from the five-year-old boy bewildered both women. Bertha Miller quickly said, goodbye, to the daycare teacher and dragged her reluctant son to the exit. It turned out that after watching the movie, the children were drawing their favorite animal, and Vernon wanted to show his drawing to his mother. She promised him. Tomorrow, you'll show me your stork, all right? I'm busy today, I need to check the essays. Her son reluctantly agreed but immediately demanded. Mom, will you read me a story about a wizard? In the child's eyes, there was a mix of various emotions, and she couldn't refuse him. Later in the evening, as she checked her students' creative works and Vernon patiently waited on the couch, she said. Vernon, head to bed, and today, instead of a story, I'll read you an essay by a girl. What's her name? Velma Taylor. Let's see what Velma wrote. Bertha Miller read Velma Taylor's essay and couldn't hide her astonishment. From the very beginning, it seemed as if the work wasn't written by a ten-year-old girl but by an adult. One particular passage from the student's work deeply touched Bertha's heart. They say there are no wizards in the world, but that's not true. They live among us and perform miracles every day. Some heal, others teach and feed people. And there are wizards who save lives, they aren't afraid of fire, water, or heights. Such a wizard saved my kitten Johnny in the spring, who got stuck in the drain pipe. When I grow up, I want to do something useful for everyone. My biggest dream is to make sure children don't get sick or die. Vernon was already peacefully asleep, while his mother repeatedly reread Velma Taylor's essay. Echoing in her ears was Mrs. Clark's voice, a modern teacher must inspire children to create, and you're using cheap tactics to gain authority. This is your final warning, otherwise, you'll be expelled from school. The essays of other children didn't differ much from Velma Taylor's work. Though the kids presented the most fantastical versions of their missions, the desire to bring goodness into the world united them under the guise of a wizard. Only Brock Lewis went slightly further than the other kids. He wanted to make all the inhabitants of the galaxy happy. The class's main troublemaker was convinced of life existing on other planets and believed it was his duty to fight global evil. In Gloria Simmons' essay, there were no grand declarations, but it still painfully pierced the young teacher's heart. The girl dreamed of creating a universal cure for all illnesses. Due to her father, the principal suspected Bertha Miller. A tragedy struck the Simmons family a little over a year ago. Gloria's mother passed away from cancer. This loss had a heavy impact on the child's health. Gloria frequently fell ill and attended school with an inhaler. The slightest excitement could trigger an attack in the girl, so Bertha Miller tried to create a friendly atmosphere in the class, and she succeeded. 
When Gloria's serious illness was discovered, her father wanted to switch her to homeschooling. Of course, it'll be tough for Gloria to adapt. She's social, but I don't see any other way. I don't want people to look at her with pity as if she's incomplete, said her father. Bertha Miller was shocked by the father's words and even protested. Harry Simmons, how can you say that? We have very sensitive people in our team. Anyone can fall ill. You're only right that Gloria shouldn't be isolated from school. Among colleagues and friends, she'll find it easier than at home within four walls. Thanks to Bertha Miller, Gloria Simmons remained in school. Bertha Miller was convinced she did the right thing by insisting that the sick girl study alongside her peers. She naively believed that other educators held the same opinion. But one day, Bertha Miller became an involuntary witness to a discussion on this topic in the teacher's room. That day, after the bell rang for a lesson, she returned for a journal and overheard two teachers talking about Gloria. The first teacher expressed sincere regret. It's a pity for the child. Only 10 years old and has gone through so much grief. First, losing her mother, now this asthma. But in the second mentor's voice, there was no trace of compassion. As they say, everyone gets what they deserve. The blame lies with poor genetics, and I think sick children should be educated separately. The first teacher was outraged. Mrs. Anderson, your statement smells like, you know what? The deputy director, the one who spoke so harshly about sick children, interrupted her conversation partner. Oh, stop it. There's nothing to smell. It's solely my opinion, and I don't impose it on anyone. But at least I'm not hiding behind lofty words like some people, pretending to be compassionate just for their own importance. The deputy director wanted to add something else, but she was interrupted by the journal that slipped from the young teacher's hands. Mrs. Anderson, in alarm, clutched her heart and disapprovingly said. Bertha Miller, eavesdropping isn't good. Bertha Miller rushed out of the teacher's room. The incident was concluded, but the involuntary witness was burning with shame. She reproached herself for not immediately revealing her presence and was thus noticed behaving unworthily. Several months had passed since that unpleasant incident, but Bertha occasionally remembered the deputy director's words about genetics. It wasn't the first time she had heard them in her short life. Almost 20 years ago, another woman, also a schoolteacher whom Bertha idolized, once said. This girl has spoiled genetics. Scientists claim that children don't remember events from early childhood. But Bertha Cox vividly remembered everything from the age of three. She was the youngest in the family, and her mother brought her into the world when she was over 40. Her mother loved a lively life and frequently changed her common-law husbands. Often in the evenings, as soon as a noisy company gathered in the house, the woman would start confiding. I can't help it. I was born this way, lacking love. That's why my first lawful husband ran away from me. He ran, leaving his sons. At this point, Bertha's mother usually burst into tears, and one of the drinking companions would console her. Don't cry, Bertha, your time will come. Such participation encouraged the woman, and cursing her fate, she drank even more. The elder sons tried to cope with their mother's bad habit. In rare moments of sobriety, she'd cry and promise to change, but once Darby had a bit to drink, she'd forget everything and start scolding her sons with harsh words. Who do you think you are to give me orders? Nobody here needs you. You can just disappear. One day, Ethan and Kevin left the parental home forever. But Darby didn't immediately notice the disappearance of her older children. She realized only a week later, asking her daughter. Jacqueline, where did our boys go? The eldest sister rudely replied. I don't know. They packed their things and left. I'll leave soon too, because I've had enough of everything. Darby was in a good mood and didn't like her daughter's tone. She grabbed a cutting board from the table and started to discipline Jacqueline. The elder sister screamed in pain and offense, while Bertha, frightened that she might also get it from her mother, cowered in a corner. Such disciplinary actions were not uncommon in an incomplete family, so neighbors often complained about Darby. 
but their signals went unanswered because at that time, it was very difficult to find someone for the position of a janitor, and despite Darby's penchant for strong drinks, she diligently fulfilled her duties. There was always order and exemplary cleanliness in her area, so in the housing department where she worked, the complainants were always told, we have no complaints against Mrs. Cox. She works well, is never late, and as for her drinking, not everyone has to be sober. Darby Cox knew that her neighbors were spreading rumors against her. Often, in a state of strong intoxication, she would threaten them. Vermin, I'll get back at you. You'll be sorry. Of course, the next morning, the woman would forget about the threats and, with a throbbing head, go to work, and in the evening, it all repeated. Rumors about her daughter's behavior reached the grandmother, who lived in a remote village. Mrs. Griffin arrived unannounced. The party in the service apartment was in full swing when the elderly woman timidly opened the door. The scene before her eyes could shock any normal person. Dirt and scattered bottles everywhere, and drunken people at the table. Without much thought, Mrs. Griffin grabbed the mop that the hostess had left in the hallway and, shouting, get out of here, rushed to disperse the company. Darby Cox was already in a state where everything around seemed unreal. She stupidly smiled and kept repeating. Mom has arrived. Why didn't you send a telegram? I would have met you. When the strangers cleared the room, Bertha emerged from the wall-mounted cupboard. Jacqueline, the elder sister, had been hiding in the bathroom all this time. She ran up to her grandmother and started begging. Grandma, take us with you. We'll listen to you. We'll help. Together with her granddaughters, the elderly woman brought some semblance of order to the apartment. Only then did she ask. Did you eat today? Jacqueline swallowed hard and said quietly. I had lunch at school, but Bertha probably didn't. Mom hasn't been taking her to the daycare for a few days. The elderly woman was horrified. Mom leaves Bertha alone? Jacqueline didn't understand why her grandmother was surprised. Yes, what's wrong with that? She used to leave me too when I was little. We're used to it. Mrs. Griffin hugged her granddaughters and burst into tears. At that moment, her daughter Darby was sleeping peacefully on the couch. In the morning, she woke up at the usual time and in a bad mood. Seeing her mother sleeping on the couch with the granddaughters, Darby rudely nudged her mother. Mom, why did you come? If you're going to raise me, it's better to leave now. I don't need your lectures. Mrs. Griffin, cautiously not to wake the girls, got up from the indented couch. She grabbed the grown-up daughter by the hair and dragged her into the corridor. Darby, if you don't stop drinking, I'll crush you with my own hands. The hangover was severe, and the negligent mother couldn't resist it. But she knew that her elderly mother always kept her promises. The sisters didn't know what their grandmother had frightened their wayward mother with, but she did indeed stop drinking. Most likely, Darby Cox was simply forced to change her lifestyle because Mrs. Griffin firmly stated, Don't expect me to leave. And if you lead a reckless life, I'll strip you of your parental rights. Bertha vividly remembers that their lives significantly changed for the better with the arrival of their grandmother. Now, the apartment was always tidy, and pots with first and second courses stood on the stove. The sisters were afraid to believe in the changes and begged their grandmother not to leave. But Mrs. Griffin sadly replied. I've already stayed for too long. And my house is left unattended. Soon it will be spring, I need to sow the beds and plant potatoes. And you will come to me with your mother in the summer. Jacqueline didn't want to let her grandmother go. You'll leave, and mom will start drinking again. Let her try. Mrs. Griffin shook her impressive fist for emphasis. This gesture was noticed by Darby Cox and correctly understood. Two months remained until the summer holidays, and the girls expected their mother to relapse every day. But Darby Cox had already tasted normal life and cheerfully said. Don't worry, girls, everything will be fine. I applied for leave. We'll go to grandma's. And then, God willing, we'll visit Ethan and Kevin. Let's see how they've settled in the north. But these plans were not meant to come true. 
In late May, their mother came home early from work and complained of feeling unwell. I don't feel good, girls. I'll lie down for a while. At first, the sisters thought their mother had started drinking again. By evening, Darby Cox felt really bad. She had vomiting and severe abdominal bloating. Jacqueline called a neighbor for help, and when she arrived, she was shocked to see the woman. Oh my, she's really in bad shape. We need to call an ambulance. Darby Cox was taken to the hospital, and the sisters lived and dined at the neighbors for two days until their grandmother arrived. They never saw their mother again. She died on the fourth day from liver cirrhosis. Immediately after the funeral, officials from the housing department came and demanded that the apartment be vacated. This is a service apartment. We've already found someone to replace your daughter, so try to move out as quickly as possible. Mrs. Griffin said. Thank you for giving us time to pack. But she had to comply with the demand. The elderly woman gathered her granddaughters and took them to her village. Even during her husband's lifetime, they built a real wooden palace there. During her active work period, Mrs. Griffin was elected a deputy in the village multiple times, and her hard work was recognized with state awards. Therefore, the status of an honorary citizen required her to have decent housing. But her husband didn't have time to enjoy the changes and soon died of a heart attack after moving. Since her wayward daughter moved to the city and began to lead a reckless life, Mrs. Griffin had to spend her days alone. The elderly woman was sure that nothing would prevent her from obtaining guardianship of her granddaughters. But the authorities had already changed several times and categorically refused her, citing her advanced age. Jacqueline was immediately sent to an orphanage, and Bertha was left with her grandmother for the time being. The official handling the case explained hesitantly. All the institutions in the state are overcrowded. As soon as there's an available spot, we'll notify you immediately. Mrs. Griffin was a law-abiding citizen since she had been a deputy not long ago. So, every day, she anxiously waited for them to come for Bertha. The elderly woman flinched at every knock and rustle and was tormented by the waiting. But half a year passed, and no one came for them. It seemed they had been forgotten, and every evening, Mrs. Griffin would tell her little granddaughter hopefully. Well, another day has passed, Bertha. God willing, no one will remember you. And we won't insist. After all, it's much better for you to be with your own grandmother than in an orphanage, isn't it? Though Bertha had no idea about state-run institutions for orphan children, she completely agreed with her grandmother. So, with the typical optimism of a child her age, she always responded. True. I really like living with you, Grandma. It's a shame Jacqueline isn't here. This reminder caused the elderly woman physical pain. Several times, together with her younger granddaughter, they visited Jacqueline, and she asked to be taken away. When they came for the third time, they were told that Jacqueline Cox had been transferred to an orphanage in another state. The grandmother asked what caused this transfer, and the stern lady replied. As soon as you left last time, your girl ran away. Fortunately, we caught her at the bus station in time. This is our first case, so we decided to place the runaway in a different institution with stricter conditions. Mrs. Griffin was disturbed by the last words of the institution worker. Dash of such terms are usually used in prisons or colonies. Strict conditions in an orphanage? That sounds terrible. The woman was taken aback and even tried to justify herself, but the grandmother didn't listen to her. Mrs. Griffin planned to visit the orphanage where Jacqueline was transferred, but she fell ill. Then it was time to enroll Berta in first grade, but the pleasant chores were overshadowed by the fact that education officials suddenly remembered the girl was still with her grandmother. They became active, but Mrs. Griffin didn't sit idly by. She sought help from her acquaintance, Mrs. Morgan. They had been fellow deputies and close friends. Despite being of retirement age, Mrs. Morgan was the director of the village school. Mrs. Morgan willingly intervened on behalf of the district's esteemed resident and ensured that the granddaughter stayed with her grandmother. Of course, the bureaucratic process took a lot of time and effort, but Mrs. Griffin felt relieved. Berta remembers how her grandmother teared up. Dash, well, Berta, we've won the first battle. Now we just have to bring back Jacqueline. 
but there were serious problems in this matter because Berta's older sister had beaten up a classmate, leading to her transfer to a closed type specialized institution. Upon hearing this terrible news, Mrs. Griffin rushed to save her granddaughter, but she was only allowed a five-minute visit. However, Jacqueline didn't want to talk to her elderly relative and remained silent throughout the five minutes. Only at the end did she say reproachfully. Dash, why didn't you take me? You took Berta, but not me. The elderly woman had nothing to answer this question, leaving her with a lingering sense of discomfort. Perhaps for this reason, immediately after returning home, Mrs. Griffin fell ill again. She never fully recovered, so she didn't visit the elder granddaughter anymore. She decided to devote herself entirely to raising Berta. But the joyful school life of the younger Cox on the third year began to falter as well. The unsightly history of the girl's family, for reasons unknown, became public knowledge. Even classmates were aware that Berta's mother died because of drinking, and her older sister was in a special closed institution. The children began teasing the girl. Dash, hey, Berta, you're not going anywhere either. Why bother studying? The colony is waiting for you anyway. Berta wasn't someone who could defend herself with fists. She concealed her grievances deep in her heart because she was afraid of upsetting her grandmother. She thought fearfully, if grandma dies, they'll send me to a special institution like Jacqueline. Once, there was an incident in class. The teacher's wallet went missing. Classmates immediately began pointing fingers at Berta. Dash, it's Berta. Her sister's a criminal, and her mom's a drunk. She stole the wallet. For the first time in her life, the girl tried to prove she hadn't taken it, but no one listened to her. All the teachers rushed to investigate the incident. First, they emptied Berta Cox's backpack. Then all the other students in the class underwent this humiliating procedure. But in the midst of this investigation, the school principal burst into the classroom. Mrs. Morgan was astounded and shouted. Dash, what are you doing? Stop this outrage immediately. The instigators of the illegal search tried to defend themselves, but at that moment, the teacher who had been the victim of the alleged theft joyfully announced. Dash, it's found. I found my wallet. It turns out I accidentally left it at home. The participants in the unpleasant scene dispersed, and Berta cried bitterly at the back of the room. Nobody even thought to apologize to the little girl unfairly accused. The teachers wanted to put an end to this incident, but when the students' parents learned about the search in their class, they were outraged. One father said. Dash, the whole class suffers because of one rotten apple. Get rid of that girl with a bad genetic heritage, and there won't be any problems. The teachers hesitated to inform the parents that no one had taken the teacher's wallet, she had simply left it at home. The upset father aired all his grievances in front of the children, and Mrs. Morgan didn't stop him. After that wild incident, another complex began to form in Berta Cox. Later, she repeatedly heard remarks about her genetic spoilage. What was most hurtful was that the teachers looked at her with pity and some hidden fear. It was as if they expected the little girl to attack them and harm their well-being. Throughout her years at school, Berta Cox constantly faced humiliation and disdain from her peers. She had no friends and kept all her emotions to herself. Only once did she decide to tell her grandmother about her troubles. Mrs. Griffin listened to her granddaughter, her eyes wide with horror. And when the girl fell silent, the old lady burst into tears. Dash, why didn't you tell me before that you were being bullied at school? I would have spoken to Mrs. Morgan. The girl interrupted her grandmother. Dash, your Mrs. Morgan is no better than the others. She never stood up for me. Mrs. Griffin held her head in her hands. Dash, my girl, what should we do? We only have one school in the whole district. Berta sighed. Dash, even if there was another school, I still wouldn't change where I study. Just a little more than two years to endure. I just need to get my certificate, and then I'll forget about everything. The elderly woman agreed. Dash, and rightly so, my dear. You'll enter university, get a profession, start a family, and forget the terrible dream and school, and your unhappy childhood. 
Berta nodded in agreement, but she thought to herself that childhood is something one never forgets. However, she didn't tell her grandmother about it because she didn't want to upset her. With each passing day, Mrs. Griffin grew weaker, and her granddaughter tried to surround her with love and care. After all, her grandmother was the only person in the world concerned about her fate. At last, Berta Cox received her diploma. The young woman declined to attend the graduation party, eager instead to sever all ties with the school she disliked. As far back as fifth grade, she decided to pursue studies at a pedagogical university but only revealed her plan to her grandmother just before applying to the institution. Mrs. Griffin was initially surprised. After everything you've been through, you want to become a teacher? But after some thought, she said, but you're right, Berta. You've experienced the flaws in our education system firsthand, and I'm sure you'll never repeat the mistakes that our school teachers made. Go, study, and don't worry about anything. With these encouraging words, Mrs. Griffin went to the cupboard. Berta, help me a bit. We need to move this cupboard. The young woman obliged, and together they shifted the old-fashioned cupboard away from the wall. The grandmother pointed to a small niche in the wall and said with satisfaction, this was devised by my late husband when this house was built. He said, Linda, this is our safe deposit box. We'll save for a rainy day. But I decided not to wait for those rainy days and saved a bit from each pension for your education. Here, take it. The old lady handed over a fairly substantial package and the granddaughter showered her with kisses. What a surprise. You're the best grandmother in the world. You're extraordinary. The young woman hugged the old lady tightly. Studying at the university came easily to Berta. She didn't get distracted by entertainment and earned respect from both her peers and professors from the first year. Here, nobody cast sidelong glances at her, nobody spoke about her relatives, so she gradually started shedding her complexes. Little by little, the orphan's soul began to thaw. She started smiling more often, which worked in favor of her appearance. Once, a dorm neighbor remarked, Berta, I'm amazed by your composure. Guys are noticing you, but you behave like a nun. If I were in your place, I'd change my suitors every week. Berta secretly dreamed of romantic dates, but at the same time, she was afraid of relationships with men. Perhaps this fear was also linked to childhood memories. Once this topic came up when Berta visited her grandmother for the weekend. Mrs. Griffin began from afar, a woman finds it hard to live in this world alone. She needs to feel a strong shoulder beside her. I was like a rock behind my Zack. We lived soul to soul for more than 40 years. He was very handsome in his youth. Girls chased after him. One even climbed over the fence and ambushed him on every corner. Although Berta understood where her grandmother was leading the conversation, she didn't react. Grandma, it's not hard to guess that you fought off your Zack's competitors. The old lady, filled with pride, straightened her shoulders. Of course, I was no shrinking violet. Plus, I worked very well. Earlier, they respected girls who showed achievements at work. But don't think I'm boasting. I brought up this topic for a reason. Berta chuckled. I don't know. Mrs. Griffin paused, then declared, it's time for you to think about your family, or it doesn't look good. You're already 20, and you're not dating anyone, or… The old lady squinted her poorly sighted eyes and fixed a sharp gaze on her granddaughter's face. Or do you have someone, and you don't want to tell grandma? Grandma, if I have a boyfriend, you'll be the first to know. Clearly, the elderly woman was disappointed by this response. At least live to see your wedding. Berta really wanted to reassure her grandmother, but she genuinely didn't have a bow, and she didn't know how to lie. Everything changed in her final year. Christmas was approaching, and a doormate casually asked, Berta, don't you want to have a little fun? The young woman had heard similar offers many times, but always declined. But suddenly, she remembered her grandmother's words and began questioning the neighbor. Having fun is possible, but it depends on where and with whom. Melissa eagerly explained, did you really think I'm a fan of anything goes parties? No, I'm a smart and cautious girl, so I only attend safe events. 
Anyway, in a couple of days, there's a relaxation evening at the Physical Education University. Our girls go there all the time. There are some really handsome guys there. Melissa rolled her eyes. Well, think about it, and tomorrow, give a final answer. Of course, Berta had been to student parties at her university before, but she usually didn't stay long at such events. This time she had a feeling that something unusual was going to happen, and her intuition didn't deceive her. That evening she met Clinton Miller. This self-assured guy, with his eloquent speech and toned muscles, immediately captivated the girl. They wandered through the winter city until almost morning, and Clinton enthusiastically shared his life plans with her. The main dream of this ambitious guy was to establish a sports school. Without any hesitation, he discussed this with the girl. Berta, you might find this funny, but I'm going to create a school or even a multi-profile sports complex for kids. Can you imagine how it will sound, Clinton Miller School? Pretty cool, right? Berta nodded eagerly, thinking, he's so determined. It feels so easy to be around him. Clinton noticed the impression he made on her and continued in the same vein. When my father, who was a European boxing champion, took me to the children's sports school, I cried for a week. Mom wanted me to pursue music or drawing, but Dad insisted that a man should be strong. He literally dragged me to the first training session, where I got a good beating right away. Mom nearly died of horror when she saw the bruise on my cheek. She screamed at Dad, threatened to divorce, then got used to it. I'm very grateful to my father for the right upbringing. Clinton escorted her to the dormitory and promised to come the next evening. They started dating, and within a week, it felt like Berta had known Clinton for a hundred years. But what she liked most was that he never questioned her about anything. Only after three months did Clinton ask where she went every Saturday. Berta replied, to my grandmother. She raised me, and now she's quite old and needs help. Clinton immediately said, I want to meet your grandmother. Mrs. Griffin was pleasantly surprised when her granddaughter arrived with the young man, whom she described as a pleasant-looking. The old lady was rejuvenated and hastily set the table. Then they washed dishes together, and Mrs. Griffin shared her impressions in a half-whisper, good guy, Berta. Hold on to him. Clinton also liked the girl's grandmother, and the solid house left an indelible impression on him. Berta, we also have relatives of my father in the village, but I've never seen such large houses. A real oak, the walls practically sing. You could get good money for such an estate. She thought Clinton was joking. Who wants to buy a house in the village today? Everyone's rushing to the city. Not true. Nowadays, living close to nature has become fashionable, and the number of people willing to move is increasing every day. That's why houses like your grandmother's are selling like hotcakes. There was something in the young man's tone that Berta didn't like. Only when she returned to the dormitory did she realize that Clinton was talking about someone else's property as if it were his own. But she immediately tried to calm herself, why are you nitpicking at him? Clinton simply made a practical suggestion, and there's no ill intent. Some time passed, and Clinton brought up a pressing issue again, but this time, he seemed to show concern for Berta herself. You'll graduate soon, where do you plan to live? This question caught her off guard because she had never looked that far into her future. The girl answered hesitantly, I'll go where I'm assigned, and they'll probably provide some accommodation for me. Clinton mocked her, some accommodation. Are you planning to wander through rented corners all your life? And what do you suggest? Nothing special. You're an orphan, so as a young professional, you have every right to housing under a special program. Perhaps you've seen on TV how very young people get apartments through this program. I've seen, but I never thought it applied to me. Clinton impatiently interrupted her, it does, and the sooner you do it, the better for you. You need to take action, not sit around waiting for things to happen. And about mandatory service. The prospect of going far away for high ideals is just a comfort for those with something wrong in their heads. But you're not like that. Berta was completely at a loss. Clinton, I can't refuse. The young man had already taken his favorite stance, Berta, listen. I've got a fantastic plan right now. We'll submit an application today, and in three months, we'll get married. 
When you're a married woman, by law, they won't be able to separate you from your family. That's one. And two. You're thinking right, baby. As for number two, we have the housing issue. We need to get an apartment somehow. You're an orphan and a young professional, so you hold all the cards. If you're okay, with it, I can help. I have acquaintances among not poor people, and they can't live without charity. After all, such activity positively affects their image. Though much of what Clinton said didn't sit well with Berta, she agreed with him on everything. It's so nice when someone takes care of you and is ready to solve the toughest problems. Clinton Miller was charged with a new idea and called Berta early the next morning. You haven't forgotten that we're going to the registrar's office today, have you? The girl was taken aback. Clinton, I thought you were joking. What jokes? I told you seriously yesterday that I'd come for you after lunch. Don't forget to bring your passport. Berta always thought that visiting the registry office was something akin to a sacred ritual. But it all turned out to be quite ordinary. They filled out the form and then chose a convenient date for the wedding. The girl hoped that after the ceremony, they would spend time in a cafe, but Clinton said. Sorry, I'm in a rush. Promise to attend the junior competitions, but as soon as I'm free, I'll call you. Oh, by the way. There's a guy who should be present there, it'll be useful to talk to him about our apartment. The word R pricked Berta again, but she immediately reprimanded herself, if we're getting married, the apartment will be shared. So, everything is right. The blissful bride wasn't surprised that her fiancé didn't say he loved her. It was only years later that she realized Clinton married her for his personal interests. But all that came later, and before the main event in her life, the girl felt excitement. She wanted to preserve every day and hour in her memory. Meanwhile, days flew by in a glittering array, and all events merged into one bundle. Berta even complained to Melissa. I don't know how I'll endure all this, the wedding and graduation. Everything in one bottle. My neighbor sarcastically noted, you should be jumping for joy, not complaining about fate. I'd love to have such a bottle. I'd walk to the moon for that. Berta listened to her friend and caught herself thinking that she, too, was ready for thoughtless actions. But Clinton behaved differently. He charted a new plan for the next three months and executed it step by step. A week before the wedding, Berta Cox received her diploma. With hope, she asked her fiancé. Clinton, maybe we could celebrate this event in a restaurant? After all, not everyone gets a diploma every day. But the young man ruthlessly rejected the idea. Berta, why waste time and resources? We'll celebrate everything together. I didn't want to tell you prematurely, but perhaps we'll start our married life in our own apartment. The girl immediately forgot her resentment at her partner's refusal to go to a restaurant. She admired her beloved. Really, Clinton? How do you manage to solve everything? The young man was flattered by the praise and optimistically declared, I try my best for us, and believe me, I had to sweat quite a bit literally before I persuaded one guy to help out a poor orphan. That's you. My friend has succeeded in business and accumulated a substantial capital, but he got bored and wants to establish himself as a politician. He comes to our training hall and I decided to talk to him. I hope I'm making myself clear. Not entirely. I only understood that you're helping this person maintain good physical fitness. My help is a means to an end. In short, there's hope that Mr. Stewart will be generous for the sake of a positive reputation. Clinton, but I thought everything would be legal. Who told you that charity is illegal? If a wealthy person, out of the goodness of their heart, gifts an apartment to an orphan, no one will condemn them for it. And certainly not suspect any evil intent. Okay, Clinton, I trust you completely. And you're right to do so. In a family, the man should make all the decisions. Berta was quite content with this division of roles and didn't ask her fiancé any more questions. A day before the wedding, Clinton warned the bride that immediately after the ceremony, Mr. Stewart would hand her the keys to the apartment. Berta was surprised when he confidentially mentioned that he had already assessed the businessman's gift. The apartment might be small, just two rooms with an old layout, 
but it would be enough for the time being. Berta asked, Clinton, can I take a look at this wonderful gift? The guy waved his hands. No, no, it's a bad omen. You can't show the gift beforehand. And so the day arrived, which was supposed to completely change Berta's fate. She was afraid to believe in her happiness, and everything that was happening seemed like a magical dream to her. The registration proceeded solemnly, and the bride was amazed that so many people came to congratulate them. After the ceremony, right on the steps of the Palace of Marriage, Mr. Stewart, amid camera flashes, gave a touching speech and handed Berta the keys to the apartment. Dear newlyweds, may your new home be filled with children's laughter, and may your union last at least half a century, but it's better not to limit yourselves in the desire to be happy. Berta clutched the keys in her hand and once again couldn't believe everything that was happening. But another surprise awaited her in the restaurant. As soon as they entered the huge hall, she immediately saw her grandmother. The surprise was so strong that the girl couldn't utter a word. But Clinton was satisfied with the effect he produced. I think this surprise turned out to be my best one. Mrs. Griffin and I arranged it beforehand, and I brought her over yesterday evening. Berta said in confusion, but she's. Your grandmother is just fine. She spent the night at my parents' place, and I believe warm family relations have already been established. Berta managed to have a private conversation with her grandmother only towards the end of the evening when the guests started to disperse. She noticed a longing in the old lady's eyes. Grandma, aren't you happy for me? Mrs. Griffin let out a heavy sigh. Why wouldn't I be happy, happy? For me, the main thing is to see you happy, and you're shining like a Christmas garland. Oh, Grandma, you can't even imagine how happy I am. I feel like Cinderella from a fairy tale. Just be careful, granddaughter, that your carriage doesn't turn into a pumpkin. Grandma, what do you mean? Or whom? Another expressive sigh followed. I don't like all this. Too much noise and fuss. And your beloved Clinton. He's too busy. Grandma, I can't understand you. You used to like him. The old lady replied evasively, people often change their minds. Let me tell you something, granddaughter. I'll transfer the house to your name, make a gift of it. What about Jacqueline? The elderly woman again looked at her granddaughter with sorrow. I didn't want to spoil your mood on such a day, but I have to. She came to me recently. Demanded money, said we owed her for life. She said a lot of nasty things about us. I must admit, I didn't expect such behavior from Jacqueline. She's filled with hatred towards us. Where is she now? Don't know, and I don't want to know. And I want to warn you. If she suddenly shows up, don't welcome her warmly. Jacqueline has been through a lot and can cause trouble for you. Berta immediately forgot her grandmother's warning. Her older sister appeared at the door of their apartment two years after the wedding. She was brightly and garishly dressed, chaos reigning in her brightly red hair. At first, Berta didn't even recognize her sister and asked, Lady, who are you? Jacqueline laughed loudly and hugged the young woman tightly. Little one, didn't you recognize me? Of course, it's been so many years. You were cuddled under Granny's care, and I wandered through children's homes. Berta sighed, Jacqueline, my sister. What a surprise. You can't imagine how much I missed you. Come in and make yourself at home. Berta was genuinely happy to see her sister after so many years of separation. However, Clinton was slightly disturbed by the presence of another resident in their cramped apartment. But the emotions of the hosts did not concern the guest. Jacqueline quickly settled into her younger sister's apartment. Initially, she enjoyed taking care of little Vernon and helping Berta with culinary delights. She chattered incessantly. But whenever Berta asked a question about her personal life, Jacqueline immediately fell silent. Only once did she reluctantly confess. Life has tossed me around, Berta, not even worth remembering. I ended up in a children's home in my youth. Thank goodness I survived. Then, when I got out, I got involved with some real scum out of stupidity. Long story short, nothing but bad luck for me. 
Jacqueline buried her face in her younger sister's shoulder and burst into tears. Then they cried together, recalling their unhappy childhood. Berta soothed her sister's trembling back and whispered, Jacqueline, don't cry. Everything will be fine now. You'll stay with us for a while, get a job. Thank you, sis. I'll never forget your kindness. Days turned into weeks, and weeks into months, but Jacqueline didn't rush to find a job. Berta hesitated to remind her of her promise, but eventually couldn't hold back. Jacqueline, how is your job search going? Her sister looked at her with undisguised surprise. What are you talking about, Berta? I'm constantly here with Vernon, and you know how much nanny services cost? While astonished Berta processed what her sister said, Jacqueline brazenly suggested. Let's do this. I'll take care of your child, and you go to work. I'm not much use here. Even if I manage to get a job at a cafe, with no education or experience, they won't trust me with anything else other than a bucket and a mop. But you're a teacher, everyone respects you, and you have a decent salary. In the evening, Berta told her husband about the conversation with Jacqueline, and surprisingly, Clinton was pleased. Your sister is right. Why should we look for a nanny when a family member is here? I think we can entrust our son to Jacqueline. But apparently, Berta's husband had a slightly different understanding of the concept of family. One day, Berta returned home earlier than usual because half of her class was absent due to illness. Unaware of what was happening, she cautiously opened the door with her key. Little Vernon was sleeping soundly in his crib. Berta tiptoed into the bedroom and was stunned by what she saw. Clinton and Jacqueline were engaged in an affair. The young woman couldn't move. She simply watched the scene, and when the lovers noticed her presence, she spoke very quietly. Both of you, get out of here. Leave. Clinton first tried to justify himself, then started threatening. Jacqueline immediately resorted to threats. Sister, didn't it occur to you that you should share with your loved ones? It's unfair, you have an apartment and a husband. With the same horrifying calmness, Berta said. You can take the husband, but if you don't leave, I'll call the police. I'm sure meeting them won't make you happy. Surprisingly, the lovers quickly gathered themselves and left. Although Clinton warned. Berta, you'll regret this, and don't think I'll leave you in peace. No, darling, I'll make life bitter for you. The young woman didn't think her husband would stoop so low as to seek revenge. But it soon became clear that she knew very little about her spouse. Clinton showed up every evening, insisting on returning to the family. Berta, why are you pretending to be a saint? I'm a normal guy, and nothing human is alien to me. Your sister made such scenes in front of me that I couldn't resist. She was disgusted to look at and listen to this man but wanted to part ways without a scandal. Clinton, I understand you, and I don't even judge you. But understand me, after everything that happened, I just can't be with you. The man attempted to get closer to her. Why not, Berta? And then she exploded. At least because, Clinton, you slept with my sister in our marital bed. Now it physically disgusts me to even stand next to you. Clinton angrily shouted, Berta, you're just looking for additional reasons to argue. Remember, I won't grovel in front of you. Get a divorce if you're so eager to join the list of single mothers. But remember, you got this apartment thanks to me, so I'll insist on dividing it. This brazen statement left the young woman at a loss, but there was no time to deal with this problem because Mrs. Griffin suddenly fell ill. Mrs. Morgan informed her of this news. Berta, come quickly, Mrs. Griffin is in a bad state. I visited her the day before yesterday. Everything was fine, she treated me to mushroom pies. But today, I went to see her, and she's lying there, looking around with her eyes. Berta grabbed her son and headed to the village. Seeing her with her great-grandson, Mrs. Griffin revived a bit. She even tried to smile but couldn't say anything. With a sign, she asked her granddaughter to take her hand. Berta cried, feeling the warmth fading from her kind grandmother's hand. Her lips whispered silently. Granny, my dear, don't leave. Don't leave me alone. Mrs. Griffin didn't live a week to her 90th birthday. 
On the day of the honorable resident's funeral, there was a terrible rain, and within half an hour, huge puddles, resembling lakes, appeared everywhere. Raindrops fell on the water's surface like pebbles, creating trembling circles where they landed. This phenomenon was mesmerizing, and Berta couldn't take her eyes off the huge puddle that had formed right in front of her grandmother's house. Mrs. Morgan approached her and said quietly. Nothing to be done, Berta, that's life. Linda has now reunited with her Zack, they'll have more fun together. But you have to live and raise your son. The divorce process dragged on for a long two years. At first, Clinton didn't want to grant his wife a divorce, narrating in court what a model husband and father he was. Then he began demanding a division of property and the apartment. Berta didn't expect such low behavior from him, but not wanting to stoop to his level, she allowed her husband to take some furniture and the new television that his parents had given them as a wedding gift. But this wasn't enough for Clinton. He called her every day, reminding her. You won't easily get rid of me. Have you forgotten that I was involved in getting you this apartment? But Berta had learned to fend him off and wasn't shaken by her husband's attacks. To his accusations, she firmly replied. I received this housing by law, albeit with your involvement. But that doesn't change the essence, and you're not entitled to this living space. Understanding that he wouldn't succeed with the apartment, Clinton began to blackmail her, threatening to take their son. You're not capable of providing everything Vernon needs, and I'll demand that our son stay with me. But the man's plans failed, and the court left the child with his mother. Clinton was allowed to visit Vernon on weekends. It seemed like everything was settled, and both sides should accept the new rules of peaceful coexistence. But after the divorce, Berta's life turned into a nightmare. Clinton started bothering her with calls and unexpected visits. He openly spied on her, trying to gather compromising information. The young woman was worn out, and this began to show at work. Once, the school principal called her for a talk. Berta Miller, what's going on with you? She barely whispered, I have troubles at home. Surprised, the principal said, everyone has troubles in life, but you can't bring your household problems to school. Remember, you work with children, and your mood affects the psychological state of the students. I'm sorry, but for now, I'll have to transfer you to the extended day group. It will be calmer and safer for the children there. She tried to protest, but I have a little son, I have to pick him up from daycare by five. And the daycare is on the other side of town. The principal spoke firmly, Berta Miller, I'll say it again. Solve your problems urgently, otherwise, we'll have to part ways. Losing her job meant being left without a means of survival. She had to adapt to the new conditions. She barely made it in time to pick up her son from daycare, and the caregivers started expressing their displeasure. Berta Miller, you're the only one. All parents pick up their kids on time, and you show up just before closing. She apologized, trying to explain, you see, my job. Everyone has a job, but children need to be picked up on time. Once, she arrived at the daycare, and the smiling daycare worker said. Vernon's father just picked him up. Berta rushed at the daycare worker. I warned you that we're divorced. Can I remember everything? The father came, the child didn't resist. Struggling to breathe, Berta dashed towards the parking lot and from afar noticed Clinton leading their son to his car. With all her strength, she yelled. Vernon. The boy turned around and shouted joyfully, Mom. He started wriggling out of his father's grip, but the father didn't want to let him go. Son, we're going to the store now, and you'll pick the biggest toy car yourself. The boy shouted, I want to go to Mom. Let me go. Berta picked up her son and warned her husband, one more incident like this, and I'll file a report against you with the police. Perhaps she had such a determined look that the man got scared. He clumsily tried to justify himself, why are you yelling? Nothing happened. I just wanted to arrange a little celebration for our son. You can do that on Sunday. You should have informed me. Clinton, you'll end up being prohibited from seeing our son. After that incident, Berta completely lost her peace of mind. She pondered different ways to solve the family problem but couldn't think of anything better than leaving this town altogether. 
In the evening, she met with her former roommate Melissa and asked her for advice. Tell me, what should I do? I'm jumpy at every noise. While she recounted the constant clashes with her husband, Melissa was increasingly surprised with each passing minute. Then, with the air of an expert from a famous TV show, she said. Berta, you need to leave here, I don't see any other way. I've been thinking about that too. I'll sell the apartment, move, and switch to some other school. Suddenly, Melissa started crying, Berta, it's all because of me, forgive me. Berta Miller was surprised, how is it because of you? How is it? I dragged you to that party back then. If you hadn't gone to that event, you wouldn't have met Clinton. I didn't expect him to be a moral jerk. Yes, appearances can be deceptive. When Melissa calmed down, she suggested contacting the mayor's office. They'll help you with work and find housing. Maybe you won't have to sell the apartment. Berta didn't delay and immediately headed to the city administration. As she checked her code at the cloakroom, a familiar voice called out to her. Berta Miller. She turned and saw Mr. Stewart, who had given her such an expensive gift for her wedding. The businessman, as before, behaved as if he were being filmed for another television program. Next to such a respectable man, Berta felt awkward. Due to confusion, she started stumbling over her words. Hello, Max Stewart, didn't expect to meet you here. With the same enthusiasm, the man replied, I surprise myself. Such, shall we say, a sharp change in roles. But they say it's good for a person to change their field of activity every five years. I confess, I'm very pleased to see you and can't wait to know how you're doing. The joy on the young woman's face turned to disappointment. It was pointless to hide the truth, so Berta admitted. Not well, Max Stewart. My husband and I didn't live up to your expectations. We divorced six months ago, but I have a son. The man was disappointed, yes, a sad story. Unfortunately, nothing can be predicted in life. Apparently, you didn't come here by chance. Maybe I can help you? I feel awkward troubling you. Stuart smiled, not at all, I now feel responsible for you, so I'm obliged to help as a senior colleague and as a deputy. Based on what you've just told me, do you want to change your place of residence? Yes, I'd like to, but I don't know what to do with the apartment. It's easier than you think. A professional realtor will help you find a suitable option for exchange or sale, and I'll assist you with work. I have a good acquaintance, a friend of my wife's. She's the school principal in Abilene. It's a fairly cozy town and not too far from here. Mr. Stewart invited Berta to his office, where they discussed all the details. In the presence of the visitor, the deputy made several calls and asked her to come the next day with documents. Two weeks later, Berta and her son had already moved to the new place. To get rid of her ex-husband's calls, she changed her phone number. At school, although she was accepted with caution, the atmosphere was quite friendly. Housing was also in good shape. The apartment was just one room, but with a large kitchen, and in the hallway, you could ride a bike. And so began her new life. Not long ago, Berta Miller had a timid hope of finding personal happiness. When she started working at school, the deputy director warned her. Dear Berta Miller, our rules are stricter compared to the regular school. But I'm sure you'll adapt quickly. Moreover, you'll get a good class, R4B. All the kids are from good families, not spoiled, only Brock Lewis sometimes gets carried away, but it's a temporary phase. Mrs. Anderson was about to leave but remembered another important detail about the class. I almost forgot to warn you. In your class, there's a girl, Gloria Simmons. Please be kinder to her. Her mother recently passed away, and Gloria has asthma herself. If she gets a bit nervous, she starts having attacks. Immediately after joining the school, Berta Miller established contact with the sick girl's father. She helped him fend off the constant attacks from the school management, which was eager to get rid of the troublesome student. Friendly relations were almost immediately established between Mr. Simmons and Berta Miller. And soon, Harry Simmons began showing the young teacher signs of attention of a completely different nature. Although the young woman pretended not to notice, you couldn't deceive the heart. 
Every time she met this person, it started pounding loudly. Lately, Berta has been increasingly thinking that she and Harry Simmons share some similarities in their destinies. Mr. Simmons himself once said, Berta Miller, there are no coincidences in life, and when two lonely hearts meet, it's a sign from above. She really wanted to believe in this theory, but after a conversation with Mrs. Clark, the young teacher fell into despair. After putting her son to bed, Berta cried all night. After calming down a bit, she whispered to those who oversee human destinies from above, watching them. Why do things never go my way? Just when a glimmer of hope appears, something happens. Do I have to leave this town again with my son? Please, have mercy on me. I can't take it anymore. That night, Berta dreamed of her grandmother and herself as a little girl. It was so nice and cozy that she didn't want to wake up. But the alarm persistently rang exactly at half past six. Berta prepared to wake her son, but Vernon was already sitting in his little chair in the corner, pulling on his tights. Son, why are you up so early? The boy said, to preschool. I have to go early before someone takes my stork. What stork? Vernon waved his hand quite grown-uply, Mom, did you forget you wanted to see my drawing? Yesterday, I drew a stork because it can stand on one leg. Berta immediately recalled yesterday's conversation with the kindergarten teacher. Thank you, sweetie, for reminding me. Let me help you get dressed. The boy gladly accepted his mother's help but expressed dissatisfaction on his face. Mom, since you started working at school, you've become forgetful. You said Gloria would come to visit us and forgot. I liked Gloria. She plays with me, and Gloria's dad promised to show how little fish grow, and he forgot too. They say adults have good memories. For a few more minutes, Vernon pointed out the shortcomings of adults, and Berta Miller mentally scolded herself for her own absent-mindedness. To calm her son, she said. It's okay, honey. I'll apologize to Gloria, and we'll definitely invite her over. What about Uncle Harry? Will he come to visit us? I don't know, Vernon. Let's talk about that later, or we'll be late again, and they'll fire us from work. The boy squinted mischievously, but preschool isn't work. Berta didn't argue with her son and dragged him to the elevator. They made it to preschool on time. Vernon even managed to boast about his drawing. Of course, his stork didn't turn out very well, but every artist has the right to their own vision. On the way to the school, Berta Miller remembered the Simmons family again. Twice they had visited cafes together and had ice cream. Gloria and Vernon immediately became friends, despite their age difference. They had another joint outing when they all walked in the park near their homes. Suddenly, lightning flashed, and it started to rain. Berta Miller suggested the Simmons family wait out the bad weather at their apartment. That's it. There was nothing compromising between her and the man anymore. So, all the accusations against her were baseless. But how do you prove that to those who refuse to listen to you? Perhaps even those who oversee our destinies would find it difficult to answer that question, the young woman thought on the way back from preschool. But her mood was much better than the previous evening. From a distance, Berta Miller noticed a familiar car. Gloria waved her hand at her. Berta Miller, hello. Good morning, Gloria. As she approached them, the girl's father said with a smile, I hope you'll wish me a good day too. The woman was a little embarrassed and involuntarily glanced at the school windows. Yes, of course, Harry Simmons. I just got a bit distracted. The man asked, may I escort you to the front entrance? Berta nodded uncertainly and looked up again. Mr. Simmons whispered, Berta Miller, are you being watched? She didn't have time to respond because a crowd of children rushed past them. In unison, they shouted. Hello, Berta Miller. Have you checked our essays? Without waiting for an answer, they all ran towards the entrance, and someone called out to Gloria. Berta, come with us. There's something to discuss. The girl looked questioningly at her father, and he said, run, but not too fast, or you'll get out of breath again. They stood at the entrance, and the woman felt the hostile stares from all sides. She even regretted not evading the man's attentive gaze. 
Berta Miller, something wrong? You're acting strange today. Always looking around. Don't mind me. I just had a very unpleasant conversation yesterday, and the impression hasn't faded. Mr. Simmons understandingly said, is Belinsky bothering you? Berta was amazed, how do you know? The man smirked, heard about it. Berta Miller, Abilene is a small town. You won't have time to think about something, and everyone already knows what thought crossed your mind. I stopped paying attention to gossip long ago, and I advise you to do the same. And to annoy our common enemies, I'll meet you after classes today, and we'll have a wonderful evening. How does that sound to you? She felt waves of positive energy emanating from the man. His cheerful mood rubbed off on her. I like your proposal, and let our enemies die of envy. Mr. Simmons spoke with a resonant voice, so be it. In the evening, they went to the park where the children enjoyed themselves on the rides. Vernon also wanted some excitement, but the adults hesitated to buy tickets for the risky amusements. Berta firmly said, when you grow up, you'll slide down the slides, but for now, you can ride the carousel with Gloria. The boy grumbled, you ride your carousel yourselves. I'm not going anywhere, I'll sit on this bench until night. Berta felt awkward about her son's behavior. She was about to put pressure on the boy, but Gloria intervened. She took Vernon's hand and said, why are you being so capricious? You should listen to your mom. Reluctantly, Vernon complied. Berta watched as they walked to the ticket counter. Unexpectedly, Gloria turned back, and the woman caught her wistful gaze. Harry Simmons noticed this and sadly remarked, it's a pity for Gloria, she still can't come to terms with the fact that her mom is no longer here. Frankly, I too have only recently started thawing out a bit, and much of it is thanks to you. The man's last words fell on deaf ears for Berta. In her heart echoed a pain familiar only to those who had lost a loved one. I understand you well, Harry Simmons. I myself recently lost the dearest person, my grandmother. She replaced my parents and essentially shaped me into who I am. The man looked expressively at her, Berta Miller, let's not dwell on the sad. Look at how our children are having fun. From the outside, it might seem like their brother and sister. After the carousel, Gloria and Vernon invented their own game, resembling hide-and-seek, but with a more intense rhythm, using bushes and park benches as hiding spots. Harry Simmons watched them for a while, then grew concerned. Gloria, don't run too fast, or you'll feel unwell. Dad, I'll take it easy. Mr. Simmons continued to watch the children. It's really great to have a big family. I was an only child, and my Gloria doesn't have a brother or sister. Unexpectedly, Berta opened up, I had two brothers and a sister, but I was the unhappiest child in the world. Her voice carried so much despair that the men were taken aback. I'm sorry for touching on a sensitive topic for you. An awkward pause followed, interrupted by Gloria running up to them. Oh, I'm so tired. Can I sit with you for a bit? Sure, take a breather. Dad, you can't imagine how lively Vernon is. Berta Miller, is it true you have a huge house far, far away? The woman laughed, true. I thought Vernon was lying. Harry Simmons looked fondly at his daughter, if we ask nicely, Berta Miller might show us this beautiful house. The girl squealed with delight, awesome. I love everything unusual. Suddenly, the girl leaned against the teacher's shoulder. Berta Miller, you're as kind as a mother. I feel good with you. And I'm not scared at all. Mr. Simmons was initially speechless. Then his eyes suspiciously sparkled, and he quickly looked away, whispering softly, Berta Miller, that's more than just a confession. But she couldn't respond because overwhelming emotions stole her breath, and her head spun so much she had to shut her eyes. Gloria's inadvertent words left the strongest impression. Throughout the night, Berta replayed every minute of that evening, afraid to believe that happiness had smiled on her again. Somewhere in her mind, the thought pulsated, no, this time I won't miss it. Harry Simmons was afraid of scaring away his happiness, so they decided to manage their relationship without unnecessary noise. But the next day, the whole of Abilene knew that widower Mr. Simmons had married the new teacher. 
this event was especially widely discussed within the school walls. When Berta arrived at work the next morning, the deputy director was already waiting for her at the locker room. Berta Miller, why didn't you tell anyone about the significant changes in your life? The young teacher responded with a question, why? Why? Together, we could have organized congratulations, you know, in a formal setting. You can't detach yourself from the collective. Berta Miller knew full well that her colleagues were judging her behind her back. Once, an elderly history teacher openly expressed herself. You're quite skillful, Berta Miller. You arrived, and you've ruined the best man in our town. Aren't you ashamed in front of his daughter? Berta came home in tears. They hadn't yet moved to the Simmons family's apartment, which was much more spacious than their one-room apartment, so they lived in two homes simultaneously. Gloria was reading books to Vernon, but when Berta appeared, she fell silent and looked at her with concern. Did someone upset you? Berta tried to compose herself, no, Gloria, everything's fine. I'm just a bit tired. When Harry returned home, she told him everything, ending with. I don't understand what I did wrong. Why is it always like this for me? Just when my life starts to settle, everything falls apart. Her husband hugged her like a child, Berta, you just don't know how to defend yourself. That's your problem and misfortune. And then, you can't take everything so personally. You need to learn to respond to the blows. If you want, I'll put Belinsky in his place for you. I think that lady doesn't see the limits. The woman objected, no, Harry, there's no need. I'll handle it myself. If it becomes unbearable, I'll submit a resignation letter. That's not wise. Running away is the easiest thing to do. You have to fight for your place under the sun. With this response, the man put his wife in a dead end. Throughout the evening, she contemplated his words, only asking before sleep. Harry, how can one, as you put it, secure their place under the sun? It's elementary. Walk with your head held high and pay no attention to sideways glances. Trust me, detractors will tire and leave you alone. Such people are energy vampires. They can't go a day without feeding off someone else's energy. From what I know of Belitskaya, she belongs to that category. How do you know her? The man replied evasively, we have mutual acquaintances. We used to celebrate holidays together, but then went our separate ways. Did Belitskaya offend you? You could say that. But better not fill your head with bad thoughts, keep your chin up. If anything happens, call me. Belitskaya knows it's better not to mess with me. The husband's method proved effective, and soon the tensions within the school's teaching staff settled. A little later, that very history teacher who had previously criticized Berta called her aside. You did well, Berta Miller. Not everyone can withstand such pressure. We're used to squeezing out those who don't fit in. You, too, didn't sit well with Mrs. Clark, and everyone started pushing against you. But you turned out to be tough. Admirable. Berta saw that the woman was bursting with a desire to share something else important, and she was not mistaken. The history teacher, in a confidential tone, evaluated the situation with an experienced gaze and whispered in the same mysterious manner. Belitskaya has long been fond of Mr. Simmons. Of course, Harry Simmons is an enviable bachelor, albeit a widower. Our acquaintances talked, but I won't affirm that there was some kind of affair between them before, and then they went their separate ways, and Mr. Simmons married Mrs. Clark's friend. People say it was our cobra who cast a spell on the businessman's wife. Berta understood that the conversation was taking an unwanted turn and said, for God's sake, spare me these details. I don't entertain gossip. The history teacher wasn't offended and continued in the same vein. But this isn't gossip. I just want to warn you, Berta, to stay away from Mrs. Clark. She's a real snake. Berta didn't tell her husband about the conversation with the old teacher and tried to forget everything she was told. She dreamt of her grandmother again, but this time in the dream, Mrs. Griffin reproached her for not visiting her for a long time. Berta, you've completely forgotten about me. And after the rains, the monument on my grave has tilted, it needs fixing. The woman woke up in a cold sweat, which alarmed her husband. 
why did you jump up? It's still early. Harry, my grandma appeared in my dream. We should visit the cemetery and check the condition of her home. No problem, we'll go on Saturday. The solid structure, as expected, made a strong impression on Mr. Simmons. Harry Simmons was knowledgeable about construction and inspected the building for a long time. He paid special attention to the vulnerable spots. Berta followed him, asking every minute, how is it? But the specialist's conclusion disappointed her. Yes, the house looks sturdy, it could stand for another hundred years. But there are worrying signs, so we need to think about repairs or selling this property. She involuntarily recalled the appraisal of her first husband and thought with disappointment, and this one is also looking for profit. It was as if the man had read her thoughts. Berta, this is your property, and I won't ever encroach on it. But you understand that every house needs constant care. It's a living organism. Personally, I wouldn't mind living here. The woman objected, and what would I do here? The nearest shop and school are five kilometers away. Nonsense. It's a 10-minute drive by car. Trifles on a planetary scale. Fine, I'll think about it. But honestly, I don't like the idea of selling. Then repairs. I don't know, we'll decide later. But today, let's go to the cemetery. The monument on Mrs. Griffin's grave had indeed tilted to one side. Harry Simmons said with surprise. Some real mystique. You mentioned the grandmother in your dream talking about the monument? Berta was also amazed. Yes, she asked to fix everything and asked for more frequent visits. Okay, let's fix it right away. Mr. Simmons prudently brought a shovel and other tools with him. It didn't take him more than half an hour to fix the defect. Afterward, he said with satisfaction. That's it. Mrs. Griffin, you can sleep peacefully now. A minute later, he said thoughtfully. Your grandmother was beautiful. You're nothing like her. You're probably more like your father. Harry, I've told you, I never knew my father. I have no idea who he is or where he is now. Please, let's not go back to this painful topic. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. It slipped out. She wasn't angry with her husband, but the mood immediately vanished. Harry had previously made mistakes in conversation, and despite her efforts, it was impossible not to notice. Involuntarily, Berta started comparing him to Clinton. Over time, she found herself drawing this parallel more and more often. Intuitively, she felt she was making a mistake, but she couldn't help it. She had to seek help from Melissa again. Since they were at a significant distance, and she urgently needed advice, she had to use video communication. Her university friend listened to her with clear displeasure, then said seriously. Berta, don't you think you're being foolish? Why are you nitpicking at the guy? What are you trying to achieve? Don't you understand that if you don't change your approach to life in general, you'll end up alone with a shattered lifeboat? Let me tell you a secret, a smart woman should just overlook certain things. And I'll also tell you, don't ruin life for yourself or others, Melissa said in an elevated tone, greatly hurting Berta's pride. Annoyed by the failure, she also shouted, thanks, Melissa, for the advice. Now at least I'll know I'm a fool. Rest assured, I won't bother you again. The connection dropped, and within a minute, Berta regretted speaking ill of her friend. Next time, Melissa will definitely send me packing. She tried several times to call her friend to apologize, but there was no answer. She was the only person who understood me, and yet, I managed to ruin that relationship. Berta thought about the situation this way, but she still hoped for reconciliation with Melissa. The family life of the Simmons gradually settled into a calm routine. The children found complete understanding and didn't bother the adults, who were fully engrossed in work. Several months later, Berta felt that she was pregnant. Feeling embarrassed, she shared the news with her husband, who was overjoyed. Hurrah, there will be another astronaut in the Simmons family. As the head of our primary cell, I need to strengthen our ranks. Laughing, she asked, and how will you do that? Mr. Simmons, extending his right hand forward, declaimed, 
as the great leader of the world proletariat bequeathed, I will work, work, and work again. The leader of the world proletariat was against capitalism, and you, Harry Simmons, plan to work tirelessly for personal gain. Already quite seriously, he said, my desire isn't punishable, as I care about those closest to me. Berta, you can't imagine how happy I am that I have a family again. Glories is also happy, her episodes are very rare now. I've noticed that too. God willing, this problem will completely disappear. Awaiting the addition to their family, Harry Simmons became entirely engrossed in work. Now, he came home late, and he wasn't home on weekends either. The irregular workday was coupled with frequent business trips. Usually, he would be away for one to two days, but sometimes, he would be absent for a week. Initially, Berta easily coped with these periods of forced separation. But with time, unpleasant thoughts started haunting her. Perhaps her emotional state was affected by the pregnancy. Though when her husband came home, everything fell back into place. Once, when Harry Simmons was on another business trip, Berta went to the market with the children. She was already on maternity leave, so she could afford strolls and shopping at any time. But considering her condition, she tried to go out when the stores were less crowded. At noon, the market was sparsely populated, and she could leisurely choose quality goods. Glories helped her in this process. And Berta, look, there are good apples there. The girl couldn't decide what to call her, and Berta didn't rush events. She told both her husband and the girl. Don't pressure the child. Let her decide who I am to her. Glories chose to address her as aunt. Berta thought it was much nicer than being a stepmother. They bought apples and headed to another counter when someone touched her hand. Berta, Berta Miller. How glad I am to see you. Mrs. Anderson was positively beaming with happiness. The deputy director inquired about her health, then extensively discussed how difficult her second pregnancy had been. Her piercing voice made the young woman's ears ring, but leaving was inconvenient. Going through all the topics, Mrs. Anderson asked. Berta, where does your husband go so often? The woman immediately sensed a trap in that question but confidently replied, on business trips. He has a project in Lig City, they're about to complete it. The deputy director raised her eyebrows in surprise. Lig City? But that's in a completely different direction. Seeing the young woman pale, Mrs. Anderson realized her mistake. Oh, forgive me, Berta, I think I said something wrong. I'm sorry again. The deputy director hastily said, Goodbye. And Berta stood in the same place. It took Glories a few minutes to pull her stepmother out of her state of shock. Aunt Berta, what did that frog say to you? You shouldn't have listened to that witch. Glories, you shouldn't call adults names, especially teachers. Mrs. Anderson didn't say anything bad to me, I just felt a bit dizzy. At home, she was shaking in a fever, and familiar thoughts began to spread in her mind. But all thoughts led to the dismal conclusion, this husband is deceiving you. Most likely, Harry has a mistress, and it's not impossible that he secretly meets with Mrs. Clark. Maybe I'm not like all normal women. That's why I'm unlucky in family life. She fell onto the pillow and cried in despair. This familiar feeling had haunted her throughout her conscious life, and she couldn't rid herself of this unwanted companion. In the morning, after seeing off the children to school, Berta headed to the train station. She felt drawn to her grandmother's house, as if there was a source of strength there. She firmly told herself, I'll go, even if I cry my heart out. The distance from the station to the village was three kilometers, and this distance was very difficult for the woman in her eighth month of pregnancy. Mrs. Griffin's house was in a lowland, and she had to overcome a slightly steep descent. Even from afar, Berta noticed suspicious activity in the yard. There were people there. Her consciousness immediately suggested, oh, someone's already taken over there. Harry was right, we should sell this house and not torture ourselves. Or maybe Jacqueline moved into Grandma's house. Various thoughts raced through the woman's mind as she reached her destination. Circling around the back, she sneaked into the yard and froze in amazement. Harry, in work clothes, was sawing boards with two unfamiliar men. 
spotting his wife, Mr. Simmons also experienced genuine shock. Berta, what's happened? Is something wrong with Glories or Vernon? She couldn't speak, her body suddenly weakened. The man pushed his tools aside and barely caught her. Berta, what's wrong with you? You shouldn't worry. Why did you set off alone? She looked at him with teary eyes. Harry, I just found out today that I'm a complete fool. I thought you had a mistress and were going to see her. Tell me, why didn't you tell me immediately that you were renovating this house? The man spread his hands in bewilderment. I wanted to surprise you, but it didn't work out. How did you guess I was here? Mrs. Anderson, in disguise as a magpie, brought a piece of news. But I didn't expect to see you here, I just came to lament at my grandmother's grave. He hugged her. Berta, you're truly crazy. Why carry worrying thoughts? We can always talk heart to heart. Come, calm down, and let's go see our project. Although it's far from the final stage, the interior is almost complete. The man helped his wife up and led her into the house. As soon as Berta crossed the threshold, she gasped in amazement. The interior of the vast space exuded warmth and coziness. Furniture is due soon, then, there will be complete harmony. Mr. Simmons had a smile on his face. Berta, I know you'll ask where I got so much money. Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to ask. Don't worry, I haven't emptied the bank yet. The unexpected financial influx is because I found a good partner. He's very, very wealthy. And, by the way, he's interested in this abandoned place. And who is this unknown benefactor? Why unknown? His name is always in the headlines. Besides, he's a deputy. Maybe you've heard of Max Stewart. Berta felt dizzy again. I know him very well. He has helped me twice already. Harry raised his eyebrows in surprise. You're not joking? I see you're not. It's a small world. By the way, you'll be able to talk to him. He'll be here any minute. He wants to look at the place for development. For development? What does he plan to build here? It's the middle of nowhere. That's precisely why he's interested in this place. You see, laying a road to the highway won't cost much, and the nature here is very beautiful, and the location itself is good. But why am I telling you this? There's his car. He'll tell you everything himself. Berta looked out the window and saw a jeep approaching. They went out together into the yard. Harry went to greet the esteemed guest, while Berta stayed to wait for them in the yard. Life is indeed a strange thing. The husband and Max Stewart entered the yard, and the man stopped dead in his tracks. He looked at Berta's large belly, then at Harry, and finally spoke. Well, well, hello again. Berta smiled in response. Yes, Max Stewart, you're like my guardian angel. The man laughed. Oh, you're exaggerating, but I'm glad to see you and doubly glad that I'm helping you now, specifically you and not someone else. But may I ask, what's your connection to this house? My grandmother lived here. When my mother died, I lived with her. This house means a lot to me, as if it's the only thread connecting me to my family. Max Stewart looked at her for a long time. A shadow crossed his face, but then he shook his head, as if dispelling some vision, and cheerfully said. Well, I hope we'll meet again. If you allow, I'd like to take your husband away for a short while. Berta glanced at her watch. It's time for me to go to the city. The kids will be home soon. Max Stewart promptly said. Berta, in your condition, it's very risky to take public transport, so my driver will take you, and I'll come with your husband. Berta tried to refuse, but no one was listening to her anymore, and truthfully, the woman was relieved about it. She was very tired. On the way home, she remembered that she hadn't asked what he was planning to build in her village. Harry tried not to be away from home for long. The due date for childbirth was approaching, and he didn't want to leave his wife alone. Vernon and Glories often settled on the couch in the evenings beside Berta and bombarded her with questions. What will our little brother be like? Berta smiled. 
Well, of course, he'll be good. And you both will help him in everything. Glory spoke thoughtfully, it's so strange. Today, there's no one, and suddenly a real person. The labor began on a weekend, early in the morning. Berta slept poorly, no matter how she turned, everything felt uncomfortable. She realized that if not today, then tomorrow, she would go for the new family member. As soon as it started getting light outside, Berta headed to the kitchen but didn't make it. Pain gripped her back, she caught her breath and moved back. Harry, wake up. Her husband mumbled sleepily, Berta, now. Just a little longer, I'll sleep for another half hour. Harry, I need to go to the maternity hospital. Her husband practically flew off the bed. He looked at her with alarmed eyes. What? Already? She laughed, Harry, why are you so scared? Everything's fine. It's just time. Harry rushed around the apartment, trying to get ready, and of course, woke the kids up. Glories tried to stop him, and Vernon immediately burst into tears. Mama, don't leave. Eventually, with joint efforts, they gathered and went to the maternity hospital as a family. Harry didn't want to let go of her hand. Berta cautiously freed her fingers from his grip. Harry, go home, I'll call when it's all over. No, I'll stay here. Stop it, the kids haven't even had breakfast. Glories needs to do her homework. You understand everything yourself. He tousled his hair. Berta, will everything really be okay? Absolutely. Go home already. She hugged Glories, kissed Vernon. Listen to dad. By evening, she was holding her son in her arms, and her husband and children were on the phone, shouting out names for the baby. Okay, everyone, time to sleep. We'll decide on the name tomorrow. A collective disappointed sigh came from the other end of the phone. Good night. Berta turned off the phone with a smile. She was so happy. A real crowd greeted her from the maternity hospital. Even Mrs. Belskaya and a few teachers came to congratulate her. Berta smiled shyly, accepting the congratulations. Allow me to greet the young mother. She turned in surprise. Max Stewart was approaching her, pushing a fashionable, very expensive stroller. I got this, let's say, as the first car. Berta, can I show you? Berta nodded with a smile. Whenever she was near this person, she felt the kindness emanating from him. The man almost burst into tears. You're so good. He turned to Berta. What did you decide to name him? Berta and Harry exchanged glances. Max. This completely threw Max Stewart off track. I don't even know what to say. Oh, youth. You know how to bring tears. Before leaving, Mrs. Clark approached Berta. Am I right in assuming we shouldn't expect you back from maternity leave? Berta looked at her colleague in surprise. Well, now you not only have a businessman husband but also such a patron. Berta felt like Mrs. Clark was about to hiss like a snake. I can't answer that question right now. Berta turned away, and Mrs. Clark barely contained herself. She stood guilty in front of her, fluttering her eyes, and now look at her. She stuck her nose up high. Two months later, the holidays began. Berta thought a lot and concluded that a little more fresh air wouldn't hurt them all. Glories needed it very much, Vernon could use some walks, and little Max would be better off in the village. During dinner, Berta asked. Who's up for spending the whole summer in the village? Harry looked at her in surprise. You never mentioned this desire before. Well, I'm mentioning it now. Glories looked at her with sparkling eyes. Are we going to that big house? Berta nodded. Dad did a tremendous job there, and now it's livable. So, what do you think? Harry, what about your work? Her husband was also excited about the idea. Berta, I'll occasionally commute, and otherwise, I'll try to handle things remotely. What's there to think about? We need to go. It took two days to get ready. Berta noticed that Glories hadn't had an attack in those two days. 
She was immensely pleased, she wished for Glories to fully recover. All right, are we ready to leave? The kids were excited, running around the house, playing in front of the house. Little Max fell asleep as soon as he breathed the clean village air. Berta managed to redo everything that could be done. She arranged their things, cooked dinner, and in the evening, they had guests. Hello, hosts. Will you allow us to stay? Max Stewart smiled. Berta felt the warmth emanating from him again. Of course, come in. Harry is just about to barbecue, and the kids are eagerly waiting for shish kebabs. The evening went so well that everyone thought only ten minutes had passed. The kids were put to bed, and Berta, Max Stewart, and Harry sat outside. The man absent-mindedly twirled a glass in his hand. You know, Berta, I was in this house a very long time ago. Back then, a friend of mine's mother lived here, and her name was Mrs. Griffin. She was a very authoritative woman, but fair. You know, she once whacked me with a huge mop and kicked me out. And you know, I'm very grateful to her for that. Mrs. Griffin? But that's my grandmother. I don't understand anything. And now I'll tell you everything if we have the time. Berta felt a bead of sweat roll down her back. She had a sense that she was about to learn something that would fundamentally change her life. Harry looked warily at Max Stewart. He knew Max had wanted to talk to Berta for a while, but he didn't know about what. It turned out the conversation would be very intriguing because Max's acquaintance could only have been Berta's mother. Once, a long time ago, you could say it was in another life, I was passionate about sports, professionally passionate. First victories, initial achievements. In short, I devoted myself entirely to sports. I forgot about everything else. I had no time for girls, for parties. Of course, such dedication bore fruit, and by the time I was 20-something, I became a true star in sports. And I lost myself. Turns out, feeling like a star is very dangerous. I began to shine. Shine in restaurants, in bars. All the girls were at my feet. I squandered money, training sessions were abandoned. Money has a way of running out. When I woke up, I found out that my place as a star was already taken, and I became useless to everyone because I let down everyone I could. I was angry at the whole world. And what was left for me to do? I started drowning my anger in vodka. Very soon, I sold everything I had. I drank, not really understanding what or with whom. One day, a woman picked me up. Yes, she was older than me. She worked as a janitor. Darby also liked to drink, and that's how we sort of formed a family. At that time, she had two sons and a daughter. Berta sat with tightly clenched fists. Tears slowly rolled down her cheeks. Anyway, we lived. We drank almost every day. Sometimes I took odd jobs, even brought candies for the kids. And then, then Darby said she had to show me to her mom because her mom didn't believe Darby could find herself a decent husband and leave her wild lifestyle. I can't say Darby was entirely lost at that time, no. She was still beautiful then. Just loved to have fun. After drinking a bit, we went to meet her mother. And there was Mrs. Griffin, I tell you, as soon as she smelled alcohol on us, she grabbed a mop and started hitting us. You won't believe it. I hadn't run that fast in a very long time. What a wedding. It was just shameful. I never went back to Darby. I found a job, rented a place. I always had brains, and thankfully, at that time, I hadn't squandered all of them yet. Max Stewart paused for a moment, then continued. So, it turns out I'm not entirely a stranger to your family. Well, a stranger, of course. Berta, I understand Darby got married after me. What about your father? I've never seen him, and we've had many visiting fathers, though none stayed for long. And brothers, sisters? My brothers left when I was very young. I haven't seen them since. Although I've thought about finding them, checking in, you know. And my sister. She was immediately taken to a children's home. Grandma couldn't defend her, and I stayed with Grandma. 
Jacqueline never forgave us for that. She, she was in the children's colony. Later, she tracked me down. I wanted to help her, and she. Anyway, it's because of her that Clinton and I divorced, which, by the way, I don't regret one bit. As she spoke, Max Stewart nodded. Yes, life is not easy. I can help you find your brothers, I think it's important for you to meet. Max Stewart said, goodbye, but as he reached for the gate's handle, he turned to Berta. Berta, when were you born? Just curious. Berta replied, and he smiled. Well, I'm not saying, goodbye, I'll be visiting you often. Max Stewart got into the car, the driver smoothly drove off, and the man in the back seat pulled out his phone and started calculating something, muttering to himself. Okay, nine months ago. Damn, this can't be true. The phone fell onto the floor mat, and the driver turned back. Max Stewart, everything all right? Yes, just watch the road. He continued to calculate repeatedly, each time reaching the same conclusion. It appeared that Berta was his daughter. Max stared out the dark window. What to do now? He had never had children. Berta couldn't sleep. It seemed Harry couldn't either. Berta, what are you thinking about? I don't know. I'm thinking that Max Stewart could very well have been my father. It's a pity it's not the case. Harry propped himself up on his elbow. Berta, what if by some chance? Let's sleep, Harry. Max Stewart appeared after two weeks. Berta even thought he regretted opening up. Now they knew he hadn't always been such a successful businessman. The man didn't look well. Dark circles under his eyes, visibly thinner, and worn. Max Stewart, are you not feeling well? You could say that. He sat at the table. Berta placed a cup of tea in front of him, which he didn't touch. Berta, I have something to tell you. I never imagined this could happen. In short, I'm your father. Berta slowly sank into a chair. I... I don't know what to say. I had no idea something like this could even happen. If you can, then forgive me for everything. For not knowing, for not helping, not knowing how you lived. Although, how can such a thing be forgiven? Berta, if you want me to leave, I'll understand. Berta sat in silence for a while. Little Max fussed in his crib, and Harry quickly picked him up. Then Berta spoke. You know, when I was little, I always dreamed that my dad would be different from my mom. That one day he would find me and take me away. Then I grew up, and I thought maybe my dad didn't even know I existed. And that comforted me. I wasn't planning to find my father, I never thought a man would be happy to have a child with bad genetics. Max Stewart looked surprised, raising his head. What genetics? Bad ones. That's what teachers called me in school, and the kids teased. I still remember feeling like a trapped animal. And now, I'm glad my father was found, and there's no need to save me anymore. In the next moment, Max Stewart and Berta hugged, both crying. The children rushed into the room. Vernon cried immediately, and Gloria followed soon after. Max cried in Harry's arms. All right, enough with the tears. We should celebrate, and you. Berta laughed through her tears. Max Stewart was smiling too. Wait, does this mean I'm not just a father now but a grandfather three times over? Harry nodded. It seems so. Later in the evening, while meat sizzled on the grill and Berta and Max Stewart silently watched the fire, his phone rang. He glanced quickly at Berta and stepped away. He returned swiftly. Berta, listen to me. While I was in town, I didn't sit idle. I found your relatives. Your brothers were very surprised but immediately wanted to come visit when they found out you have three kids. They were shouting like crazy. Berta felt tears streaming down her cheeks again. Berta, they hardly remember you, but they'll be here very soon. Before he finished, a car honked at the gate. Berta walked there on legs that barely held her. She recognized them instantly. Just five minutes ago, she had no idea how they looked, but now she knew. 
hello, Kevin, hello, Ethan. The brothers embraced her from both sides. Sorry, little sister, for us. We were so happy to escape that we didn't even think about how it was for you. Life chewed us up pretty badly until we found our place in the sun. Vernon and Gloria came out of the gate. They looked cautiously at the unfamiliar people. Nephews, my, how big you are. Come in for some gifts. Ethan opened the trunk and started taking out boxes and bags. Oh my, why did you bring so much? Berta laughed and cried. While everyone got acquainted, while everything was discussed, the meat had long been grilled, the wine poured. Max Stewart stood up. Allow me to speak as the eldest and now not so unfamiliar. I almost forgot what family is. And I never knew what a big family was. It's a shame Mrs. Griffin isn't here, in whose house we've gathered. I want to say that family is very important. And now that you're all together, don't lose each other. Ethan sighed. All but one. Berta, do you know where our Jacqueline is? Berta sighed. She didn't tell them about their last meeting but shared what she knew. Yeah, she had it rough. We need to find her. Maybe we can help. Kevin nodded in agreement. We need to bring her with us. We'll find her a job, she won't have time for foolishness. For a while, silence lingered. Berta held her husband's hand, finding comfort in it. Harry had learned so much today. Not just today. He was blessed with an amazing wife. Berta glanced at her husband cautiously. He smiled with one eye, as if saying, everything's fine, please don't worry. The next day, the yard was bustling with activity. Learning about Harry's renovation plans, including building a gazebo and terrace, the brothers rolled up their sleeves. We've been in the construction business professionally for about 15 years. So, tell us, show us. We'll build a palace here in three days. Max Stewart also took off his jacket. I want to help too. Don't tell me I can buy a palace. I can, but I want to do this together, as a family. Work was in full swing. Even Vernon was handing hammers and nails to his uncles. Gloria couldn't resist, she was sweeping sawdust or helping Berta with lunch. Towards evening, the gate opened. Hello? Berta dropped a plate, which shattered with a loud noise. No, not this. She didn't expect this and didn't want it. Jacqueline, what are you doing here? Jacqueline looked at her sister and burst into tears. Forgive me, Berta. Forgive me. Envy and bitterness overwhelmed me. And then. Then I realized there was no point in blaming you for everything. You were just a child yourself. You couldn't take me out of the orphanage. I searched for you, searched to ask for forgiveness. Forgive me, I won't disturb. Jacqueline stepped back, intending to leave, and Berta stepped towards her. She looked into Jacqueline's dim eyes for a long time and then asked. Did something happen to you? Jacqueline nodded. I lost a child. You know, I roamed, fluttered around. And then, I realized my empty life ruined him. Oh, Berta, it's so hard for me. It's my punishment for everything I've done. Jacqueline broke down, and Berta hugged her. Calm down, you're not old yet. You'll give birth, get married. The important thing is that you've understood it all. They stood, embraced, and cried, and no one dared to interrupt their shared tears. Finally, Ethan couldn't hold back. He approached, hugged them. Well, hello, little sister. Jacqueline looked at him in surprise, then at Kevin, who approached. Is that you? It can't be. A week later, Ethan and Kevin were leaving. Berta, Harry, no excuses. We expect you next summer at our place. Max will be a bit older, and we can set off. Meet our families, our nephews. Berta smiled, wiping her tears. This week was like a fairy tale, everyone together, everyone trying to help each other. So much love, so much happiness. Call us, don't disappear. Jacqueline approached Berta. 
Forgive me again, little sister. See how it turned out. You're the youngest, yet you managed to bring our whole family together. Berta smiled. I forgave you a long time ago. And the family, if it weren't for dad. You've got a good one. Doesn't let go of Max, gives attention to Gloria, and Vernon, even though he has so much to do. Jacqueline, you must call me, tell me how things are going there. And please, don't complicate anything. No, Berta, the past is done. During the week I was with you, I understood a lot. If I hadn't wasted my time on nonsense, maybe I would have had a family and children by now. It turns out living a simple life is such happiness. Living peacefully with those you care about. That's good, sister. It's good you've realized that. The taxi drove away from the house, and Berta stood there, watching it go. Well, let's go inside. Berta said. Yes, let's go. You know, Harry, I think we should reconsider moving here again, especially since Dad's Rehabilitation Center for Athletes is opening soon. Harry immediately said. Berta, just think how good it will be for us here. Just imagine, they'll welcome you with open arms at school, and the kids will always be happy here. Gloria hasn't had a single seizure, even though she's running around like a young goat. Berta smiled. She had made up her mind. But let Harry speak, she'll remember everything so that he makes those snowy hills for Christmas he told her about. 